Kirk is a security consultant at TSS Cyber in Canberra, joining the team after 10 years in Air Force ICT, working on training exercises, drills, and emergency response for the military and nonprofits. He has been a dungeon master for most of his life and found those skills are surprisingly transferable to his work. He now thinks a lot about using games to improve teams, communicate complexity, and evaluate responses to crises. It's all yours. <laughs> Thanks very much. I think you did amazing. That thank you. Great. Thank you. I'm going to say it though. I think you overdid it a little. Yeah, well, that was a given. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take off my fashion mask because that's going to have me muffled and annoyed the whole time. <laughs> um, all right. So screen sharing. I'll see if I can master this technology. That, that looks like it worked. Oh, did it? Did that actually work and share? It's working now. Brilliant. That's what I like to see. So what I'd like to do for the next 20-ish minutes is to talk to you all about uh, how your documentation can lead you astray and lead to catastrophe and some of the ways that you can uh, write documentation that is appropriate for your environment and your conditions. It's not a one-size-fits-all thing. These are just a couple of different concepts that may be useful to you and mostly going to be told with a, uh, a historic example and then discussing a few different games that I like as a way to help that, uh, those ideas stick in your head. So this is me, I'm Kirk Nichols. You've kind of heard a little bit of a story just a moment ago about who I am as a person, security consultant, dungeon master, Hufflepuff, uh, and a support main in pretty much any game I play. I'll take up the healer role. What are you gonna hear from me? Uh, three stories, one about a boat versus a sandbar. If anyone's uh, been out on the water before, you know how great that can turn out. I'll talk a little bit about Untitled Goose Game because I think it's an amazing, uh, amazing game for our times at the moment in particular, but uh, it gives some really good examples of what you can do with uh, documentation and guidance. And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, a story from a Dungeons and Dragons game and what you can learn from that. So the HMS Orpheus was the flagship for the Australian squadron, uh, which was to, to understand that back in the, um, the, about 1863, when the story takes place, it was a Jason class Royal Corvette, and it served as the largest, most powerful command ship uh, in the Australian Navy at that point. Uh, and what that means is that it was, you know, the key to the enforcement and regulation uh, and security of Australian and New Zealand waters. Uh, but on the 7th of February, 1863, the Orpheus, with a complement of about 260 uh, souls on board, went into the port near at Auckland uh, to go through on a, on a fairly routine mission. Um, and as it navigated into the port, the people in command of that, uh, that ship used the navigational charts that they had available to them to navigate through the port. Now, if you're not used to boating, you may not understand that uh, these navigational charts are really, really important because what they do is they point out things like uh, navigational hazards such as islands and sandbars and things like that and the way that ships can navigate in and out of inlet areas. If you're having a bit of a trouble uh, mentally conceptualizing where that is in relationship to the o Auckland, that uh, pin there on the map should give you an idea in relationship to modern Auckland. So having a look here, you can see a closer look at that map and you'll see that there are depth gauges and directional gauges uh, around on parts of this map. And it becomes very important when you're working out where you want to uh, enter the port from to safely navigate. Now, the problem uh, with what happened with the Orpheus was they had, I should, be, I should be clear here, there are conflicting records of exactly what happened and what caused the issue. And a part of that was that afterwards the Admiralty uh, did a very, uh, a very, a very concerted uh, information campaign to diffuse all responsibility from themselves, basically. But there was uh, an updated navigational chart that was, depending on the sources you read from, either issued to the ship in concurrency with previous navigational charts, or the updated navigational chart never actually made it to the ship. In either case, what ended up happening is the outdated navigational information was used, and the ship rolled into the port and struck itself on a sandbar, which uh, beached it, basically, cracked open the hull, uh, turned it sidelong into the waves, and smashed the ship apart. Of the 259 souls on board, only 70 managed to survive that event. This is 
a beautiful painting. If you ever get to go to the Maritime Museum in Auckland, you can see this hanging up with a bit of an account of the events. Um, it shows uh, people in life rafts trying to get out there and save them. And the ship you can see in the background there was a steamer that was uh, in the port at the time that just happened to be active and crewed late in the evening and went out and tried to pick up some of the souls and save them, but only managed to pick out 70. So what does this mean for, your, for our documentation? Uh, in really safety critical areas and really uh, operationally critical areas, we should be very careful about the currency of our documentation that we're putting into the hands of decision makers and operators because the basis on which they're conducting decisions and making engineering changes uh, could be based on misinformation and outdated data, which could lead to catastrophic outcomes depending on what's going on. Where these kinds of records are really important is in high maturity environments with uh, document control and governance and things like that in place to make sure that the most current versions of your system diagrams and configs and things like that are what are published and are available to people to make those effective decisions. But what if you're not operating in one of those high risk sort of environments? You, you know, a lot of us don't necessarily operate next to industrial control systems and power plants and, and things like that, that you need to be quite careful about making changes. I mean, and the high consequence could even be, uh, you know, financial expenditure, but you know, not all of us operate in that level of criticality. We're probably more interested in making sure our documentation is suitable for work within our teams and we provide adequate guidance and structure to our people without exhaustively building documentation sets that no one ever abides by. So Untitled Goose Game has some really great lessons here. Uh, the game provides a really clear list of outcomes that need to be executed upon, which I'll talk through, but it leaves a lot of interpretation available to the person following the instructions about how they actually get to that end goal. So for those of you who don't know, Untitled Goose Game is a recently published very short game where you play a goose that is terrorizing a small town. You're given a list of goals to terrorize that town and you go about uh, taking, taking apart the town piece by piece. The way that you're given guidance and goals within the game are these to-do lists. You can see, get into the garden, get the groundkeeper wet, steal the groundkeeper's keys. They're pretty simple goals and they don't tell you exactly how you're supposed to execute on them which leaves you a lot of room in how you're gonna go about doing that. Now, this is a really uh, good way of setting out goals and directions to complete things and to complete tasks if the environment is appropriate. You can see here that there's a lot of uh, different uh, elements within the game that allow a lot of freedom in how you're gonna approach and uh, engage with the task at hand. So the important thing to know here is that in Untitled Goose Game and in the context where it's appropriate to have these sort of lists, there's a fairly low consequence to failure and you can retry and reevaluate what's going on. And you also have an environment under which that freedom of execution doesn't put anything uh, seriously at risk. To contrast that with a slightly different simple instruction that could have dramatically different consequences, you have uh, some political statements such as these, which I know we all love and adore, but if someone were to read that and not understand the context in which it was written, uh, link down there if you want to follow through and have a bit more of a read of the history of the statement and this, uh, and this piece of art, it could lead to catastrophic consequences if people don't have that context and that information available to them to properly evaluate how to uh, execute on that task. So what's to be done? Clear outcome guidance with little direction is really great in certain environments and it makes you resilient to change uh, in that environment because if you write overly explicit instructions you need to maintain those instru instructions according to changes that are occurring and that's how documents get out of date over time for example versions get updated menus get changed so if your instructions are very explicit and have screenshots from older versions you need to go back and update all those things and it's an incredibly onerous task and that may be appropriate under certain conditions as we talked about with the Orpheus but in certain, other, in certain other situations, you may situations you may want to be more general. So it's really appropriate in low consequence environments and high trust, high competence environments. Now, for example, a security operations center, you may have highly trained people operating within the team and for certain instruction sets, it is appropriate to only give them generalized direction for your seniors in particular and allow them to choose how they execute upon tasks. So in Dungeons and Dragons lore, there is this, uh, there's a concept of uh, pieces of 
uh, magical equipment called artifacts, and they go beyond your normal magical sword. These are things which are world-bendingly powerful objects. Similarly, in our technical environments, we may find compelling and powerful equipment with arcane instructions that are difficult to interpret. They may be difficult to research or understand because no one's actually written a good instruction set for them. And it's just tempting to throw it in a live environment and work it out if you can't actually understand the full consequences of what this thing is. The artifact I want to use as an example is called the Hand of Vecna. Vecna is this charming, handsome fellow over here on the right. He's a, an evil god of knowledge and magical arcane mysteries. So much power to offer. And the artifacts that are associated with him are the Hand and Eye of Vecna. Now, the way you need to use these things to get the hand or the eye to work is to sacrifice your corresponding body part and pop his body part on. And then it grants you incredible arcane power. So you can see this dragony boy here with uh, the hand of Vecna attached, which has successfully granted him all the corresponding power. Now, the head of Vecna that I referred to earlier was a piece of misinformation that was sown in a particular game world. And the players who were playing in that world decided that they would pursue it. They found something which they believed to be the head of Vecna and proceeded to try and attach it to someone. Now, this is obviously a high risk, high reward proposal, and you don't want to necessarily test this in a live environment. However, according to the story apocryphally, about half the party managed to decapitate themselves as a result. And no one ever thought to actually check if this was and genuine artifact. To talk about a bit of a lower key um, cursed item, to give you an example that not all things are as catastrophic as, uh, as the head of Vecna story, there are other lower stakes items which are still considered cursed. And we all have cursed items in our environment that we wish weren't there. Uh, this one, for example, gives you plentiful energy throughout the day, but for every day that you don't drink from it, it actually makes you more exhausted costs and benefits to everything. So what's to be done about that? Research and understanding new systems and running tests uh, is really important in introducing new things into our engineering environment. Not every new thing we find uh, on GitHub or uh, guidance we find on Stack Overflow should be put directly into our production environment unless we fully understand the consequences of what we're about to do. And that's why we have our testing environments. That's my major points that I've gone through for uh, documentation and understanding how you can write and understand your documentation and research your processes a little bit better. Um, I just want to say, I hope that that's brought a smile to some of your faces. I know that's not as technical um, as some of the other speeches, but I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. I'd like to say thanks to a few people. Um, my friend, Jesse, who made this great washable mask for me. Um, and to my friends uh, who are listed there, who provided me morale and some uh, tech setup guidance throughout this whole process. Um, if you have any questions from me, I'm really happy to talk to you about anything I've spoken about in this uh, presentation, as well as uh, during these times, setting up online role playing groups and uh, getting into doing that as a group across Australia. So let me know about a bit of experience in helping people do that. But uh, thanks very much. I think first thing I'm going to do is start a ComfyCon dash D and D room. I can do that. I can bring get in. it on. <laughs> we did fun. We did say we should have a board game room, but yeah, I think D and D would work quite I well. I think so as well. I'm going to do that right now. Create a channel. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the other one. Oh yeah, I see. <laughs> She's um she's got a rent like a whole bunch of different fabrics, but I was like, I need the dice fabric one. I need that so that I can, when I go to games. Roll twenty. Yeah, we roll twenty, right? <laughs> um, no, that... no, go ahead. I was gonna say no. That was an awesome talk. I know some of the work that I've done in the past and getting making sure documentation is somewhat accurate or at least accurate enough that you can interpolate what needs to be done. Yeah, is very important. Um. And definitely agree with the sort of difference between the the general the very specific guide uh, documentation has a very it has a role but then also the doc, the role of documentation which is you know here is your general advice go do it in the way that you feel comfortable to achieve it yeah and understanding that difference depending on who your audience is and what the 
what the environment is, right? You might have high compliance requirements, um, like the example with the Orpheus. There's a reason you have very specific and very up-to-date information in place, a process and how you approach doing the thing. But if it's if it's not that, not the case, don't labor the point in trying to write exhaustive documentation, particularly for your seniors who, you know, you are wanting to be able to exercise flexibility and judgment. You want to be able to achieve the same outcome no matter what, but how they get to that outcome may be up to them entirely. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think you've got to respect your people in that way. I mean, we're all in our own way, in our own field, very educated, very thoughtful people. Mm. Um, and we have to respect each other for that, for all the for all the knowledge we bring. I'm, I'm going to flip on that one and just say that having some documentation can save some of our, you know, more junior people as well. I think a lot of people might get a little bit afraid to ask that they don't know what's going on. So I've been writing some fairly detailed documentation recently, like to the point of how to install things in Linux and step by step. Yeah, I the, felt like, yeah, like, I needed to provide something really simple and then go back to people and go, look, if it's, if there's a better way to do it, let's talk about it. You don't yeah. have to do it this way, but if you want to do it another way, how about you write it as well so that we can all learn from it? Yeah, an, an element that I really encourage in highly specific or highly um, highly authoritative documentation that, it, that is to be complied with is to make sure that there's an understanding in your organization or at least a part in the document where it tells you who you're supposed to go to if you need to deviate from that at any point. Mm. Because there may be junior people in your organization who are nervous or unsure and they're, they're thinking, I need to deviate off this for some reason. Who do I talk to to get approval to do that? And if they don't know who to approach, um, and it's probably the document owner or the senior engineer, whatever the case is, um, that's a really difficult thing for them to work out. So putting it straight up front, you know, if you need to move away from this strict documentation, um, go talk to this person and they will give you the thumbs up or down or help, help you understand why you need to do this. No, that's fantastic. Thank you very much, Kirk. And, uh, hopefully people get some good ideas on how they can sort of improve their documentation so we don't have to go in later and uh, try and read it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, no one wants to go back and revise document suites. No, it's a very horrible experience. 